Hi, good night. Thank you for joining us uh, for our Tuesday night Bible study. Um, it's such a, a privilege to be here and to um, share with you. Thank you for joining us um, wherever you're joining us from. And if you're going to be watching this, if you're watching this uh, recording, thank you for tuning in. Um, I am Pastor Robert Carter here at All Nation Ch Church. And uh, tonight we're going to be um, sharing the word. I, well, I will be sharing the word um, tonight, and we'll be looking at the story of um, Noah. But before we do, I just want to um, have you join me in prayer just for, uh, just for a few seconds, a few minutes, and then we'll get into our study. Our Father God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for abiding with us, Lord God. We thank you for being Jehovah. Shalom, God, you are our peace. Even in the midst of confusion and chaos, God, you are still here with us, and we're so thankful. I pray, Lord God, that your word will go forth, Lord Jesus, and someone will be encouraged, someone will be enlightened, someone will be ministered to by your words, Lord God. Thank you for abiding with us, Lord God. Thank you for your grace and your mercies. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. So the last time I was here, I was um, teaching from the story of Job, looking at Job and um, his, his struggles, his, um, his perseverance, his, his strength, and his, his, um, his, res, his resilience, um, knowing that God is with him, knowing that his Redeemer is, uh, is with him. And as we've been looking at the, the thought or the theme of um, Uncharted as a church, I want to pick up on that same theme and um, take a look this time on the, the character of, Mo, of Noah. And uh, I want to draw your attention to the book of uh, Genesis, Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 through 8. It's a very interesting story, and if we had a time, if time would permit, um, we would, this story um, takes place from Genesis chapter 6 all the way through chapter 9. But I'm going to read just a short portion of uh, Genesis chapter 6, and then we'll, we'll get into the Word. So Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 through 9, uh, uh, through 8 rather, it says, The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And I'm reading from the ESV version. And that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was wholly evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the herd, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will, not, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and, anim and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. This is an, this is an interesting verse. I found favor in the the eyes of the Lord. Actually, let me go to verse 9. It says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. I'm going to stop there for now, and I may be referencing a few other scriptures as we go through this. But I want to pause for a moment and draw our attention to uh, Noah and draw our attention to the book of um, Genesis. And as we look at this book, it's a very interesting book. It's a book that speaks to us about the creation narrative of, um, of humanity. And if God's revelation of who he is to us, we're seeing in this book at God created the heaven and the earth, and God started to establish his, uh, his people. He started to give them an identity, and with that said, we see the characters of Adam and Eve, and we see the characters of um, their children, and then um, slowly the, the, the character counts as growing, so now we're seeing Noah and, and his family. And it is interesting because the way this, this um, individual, how Noah came about, is very interesting because we looked at creation, we looked at the fall, we looked at um, Cain and Abel, and 
eventually we we shift gears and we're now looking at corruption on the herd. So, so in essence, we see a, a, a few weeks ago, um, Pastor St. Louis spoke about this. He spoke about um, Adam and Eve's um, transgression where Eve was... Um, was lured into eating the, the, the fruit, and, and um, Adam being Adam pretty much followed sweet, suit and just said, you know what, Let, give me a bite. And he just went for it, and men found themselves in an unfortunate situation. But not only that, as Adam and Eve had sinned, then we were, we're recognizing as a result of their sin, as a result of their transgression, Cain and Abel are dealing with the effects or the, the result of, of sin. And here we're looking at Noah, and the Bible says that, and, and it's... Um, it's very interesting, and I, I just want you to bear with me for a bit. I'm, I'm, I may be a bit slow, but I'm going to get to my point. But it's very interesting that here it is that God created the heaven and the earth. Adam and Eve sinned. Cain and Abel got into a, a fight. All of a sudden, there's increased corruption on the earth. And here it is that God created something so beautiful, but because of the disobedience of, uh, of humanity... The world is now plunged into uh, sin and uh, unrighteousness and, and corruption. And it starts off in, in, in chapter 6, and it, it's saying that when man began, began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive. And then it starts to give you this picture of like a lot of messed up stuff were going on. And... At this point in the story, God is saying that, you know, I am, I am frustrated with humanity. I am mad. This is just too much. And the judgment of God is at hand. And all of a sudden, the story flips and it says that Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And the interesting thing is I believe the King James Version says that Noah found grace. And for us, as we look at the, the, the whole idea of grace, you know, that oftentimes the, the, the go-to definition for Christians is that grace is the unmerited favor of God. But one writer says that grace is free, sovereign favor to the hill deserve it. In other words, um, he's saying that it doesn't matter what was going on. He's saying that because even with a total depravity and, uh, of, of humanity, God gives sovereign favor, right? And yes, it is true that, that grace is the unmerited favor. But it, I want to go a step further and say that it is the unconditional love towards a person who does not deserve it. Grace is pretty much love that cares and reaches down to rescue. So it's not so much that, that Noah was, was good, why Noah found favor, but God in his sovereign nature found, um, showed Noah grace, and he showed him favor. And I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. So in the midst of the corruption... Noah still found favor in the eyes of God. And, and, and you're going to see, we, if you continue to read through the book of Genesis, you'll see a similar um, uh, narrative or a similar um, pattern that, 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 is t that took place with Abraham, that even while the, there, were, there were things that were taking place that were not favorable and were not seen to be righteous, the Bible says that, 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 that God was going to destroy everything that was, that was um, around during that time. And um, it says that, that Abraham cried out to God and says, God, there has to be a remnant of people who still believe in you. There still has to be a remnant. 
And uh, as we look at the, the, the pattern and, uh, and the narrative of Scripture, we're seeing where there's always this remnant that is still experiencing and embracing the grace of God. That it doesn't matter how messed up or how chaotic the world and the society is, there's a remnant. And I want to draw our attention to this, and I want to pull this a bit out of the, the biblical um, context and say, say to us today that the, in the world that we're living in, there's a lot of corruption. There's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of um, confusion. Um, on the political side, there, there, there's issues. There, there's the, the left versus the right. It doesn't matter what country you go to. I, th- I, I, I get the sense that every country that you go to, there's some political unrest. It may not be as blatant and obvious in some countries as in others, but there's always this, this fight, and that's the reason why you have the opposition and the ruling party, because there's always some disagreement. And I'm not saying this to, 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 to justify or for us to be comfortable with where we are as a country, but America is, America is not the only country that has, has um, political confusion and chaos. But what I'm saying to you, for wherever you are and, and you're listening to this, there's, all, there, there's, there's, there's chaos and corruption and confusion and, and unsettling realities in the political realm. In the world that we live in, there's economical issues, there's injustice, there's, um, there's social justice issues, there's, there's all these different elements that are taking place. But in the midst of it, God has called us to be a remnant. God has called us to be salt and light. It is important for us to, to draw from that, that, that scripture where Jesus, he says that, the, the, in the gospel, he says that you have been called to be salt and light. You have been called to be, to be salt and light because there is darkness that the light needs to shine in. There, is, there, there are situations and scenarios that God is expecting us to be brave and bold and, 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 and emphatic in going out and being different. We have to dare to be different. Because God has shown us his love and he has shown us his grace. And if he has shown this to us, it means that we, we need to make it known to the world. Oftentimes, I, I would say that, you know, sometimes we, we, we like to say, oh, I'm so glad that didn't happen to me. But sometimes we have to say, okay, I'm glad it didn't happen to me. And now I have the opportunity to make God's name be glorified or known because I have one more chance because of God's grace and his mercy towards us. Let me go back to Noah. So Noah is dealing with, with, with pressure. So what I, the reason I'm driving home the thought of grace is because I want to look at the, the, the whole idea of grace under pressure. Grace under pressure in the sense that, that God's grace doesn't exclude us from trials. It doesn't exclude us from from conflict and pain and, and challenges. And, and, and what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that here it is that, that Noah, even though he was seen to be um, righteous and um, faithful and he found favor in the eyes of the Lord and his, his family would be saved, it didn't, it didn't exclude him from having to go through the flood. Because the, the reality is, sometimes we may think that because we're children of the Most High God, we are royal priests, we're royal, we're, we're holy, we're set apart. And we may say, okay, we are in this world, but we're not of this world. And God loves us too much to forsake us. And God will never leave us nor forsake us. And we talk about all of these different things. And yes, it is important to reassure ourselves in the word of God. But let us remember that even though we're called to be children of the Most High, it doesn't exclude us from trials. It doesn't exclude us from, tri- from tribulation. If Jesus himself had to deal with struggles and trials and, 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 and in, um, persecution and, and insults and, and, and embarrassment, how much more us? In, in the book of um, in, in Peter's epistles, especially in the first um, epistle of Peter, he talks so much about suffering, but he says that remember that when you suffer, you're not suffering in vain. And he said that you're not suffering just randomly, but he's saying you're suffering for righteousness' sake. James says that counts it all joy when you find yourself in various, diverse, 
any type of trials and tribulation because it's a testing of your faith. And I think one of the things um, with Christianity in the Western Hemisphere, not just America, but in the Western Hemisphere, is that sometimes we, 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 we tend to um, not talk about the, the suffering and the struggles that we may have as Christians. And we portray this idea of Christianity as uh, it's a prosperity if someone is a prosperity gospel or it's the fate of the, of, of, the, of the the good luck charm and everything is going to work out fine all the time and, 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 and the, the validity and the strength of your faith is based on how well you're doing. But the, the truth of the matter is that, that the, the, the Bible illustrates to us that even though we are saved by the grace of God through faith and having that reassurance that God is with us and we're with we're in his hands he's holding us together that yes we will face trials we'll face tribulation so here it is that that Noah is dealing with trials because Noah he's found righteous and he's found to be a man that God sees as Noah, I, I favor you. I love you. I care for you. But yesterday, he had to deal with the, the, the dilemma of building a protection, building an ark. And I go back to the story of Job. And here it is that, that Job found himself in a position where Job, the book of Job opens up with God saying that, where it says that there was this man that was living a righteous life. He was seen to be righteous and he was uh, everything. You know, when you think about that description, it says that what's everything's are lovely, what's everything's are just, what is everything's are. And, and you're, you're thinking about all of this. All of a sudden you're like, okay, give me someone that I can, that I can, uh, that I can drop this on. You think about Job because you're like, oh, Job was seen to be righteous in the eyes of God. Noah here finds himself. Because the interesting thing about this is that it doesn't give us a backstory about Noah. So it doesn't tell us if Noah was living in sin and he got saved or Noah was always saved and he, he was always obedient to God. It just says to us that God was frustrated with what was going on and God was going to destroy the, the hurt. But then he used this conjunction. It says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of God. However, this is in chapter 6 of Genesis. God's grace is given to Noah, is shown to Noah. But at the same time, the story continues all the way through to chapter 9. Noah still had to deal with having to build this massive, massive ark to protect the people, to protect his family, to protect the livestock, to protect them. Noah had to do it. And as we, as we have said before that we're going through, we're pretty much living in uncharted um, territories or w whatever we're dealing with is, is uncharted. If anyone had, had to deal with uncharted um, territory or uncharted, um, it was Noah. Here it is that Noah had no picture of what a heart looked like before. This was the first time. Noah had to listen to the voice of God. And that, that's, that's the other point I want to make. You have to be so focused on God's direction in uncharted time. Because on this journey that Noah was taking, if it had not been for his obedience to the word of God, if it had not been for his obedience and, and um, his, his mindset to stay close to God and listen to what does say the word of God, then Noah would have missed the mark. Noah would have had mission drift, and he would have said, well, you know what? God loves me and God cares for me, so I don't need to work for anything. But regardless of all of this, Noah still listened to the voice of God. He still listened to the directives of God, and he pushed forward. We are reminded here that the flood not only teaches us about God's judgment against sin, but it teaches us about his mercy in spite of sin. Because even though Noah was found to be righteous, and he was about to witness God's judgment towards the sinful nature of humanity, the corruption that was taking place, 
It, it, Noah also got a chance to see the mercies of God in spite of sin. So, so it is with us as we're living in this world. Sorry, because we have to contextualize this. Even though we're seeing the, 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 the chaos that is taking place around us, it, because chaos is not just in, with, the, with, the, with the COVID-19 pandemic. There, there was chaos all along. There was issues where, where, where the, the church was losing its moral footing. It, the, the government was, it, there was, there was things that were going on that still weren't according to the will of God. And God was still speaking. God didn't just start speaking. God has always been speaking. And God has always been, been pretty much um, casting judgment and against unrighteousness. But in spite of all of that, in spite of the fact that we, we live in this world, that we, we may not be of this world, but we're in this world, we can see the hands of God and we can say that in spite of the sin and the chaos and the confusion and, 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 the, and the, the, the moral uh, um, decline, that God is still merciful in spite of all of this. In spite of all that's going on, God was still merciful. And I want you to, to take, a, take, a, take a seat beside Noah and look and see what Noah is seeing. Noah is seeing a world that is drifting away, a world that will be condemned to hell. But Noah didn't focus on the fact that, oh, you guys are so unrighteous and you guys are so messy and God is upset. But Noah focused on what God was saying to him. What is it that God is saying to you today? What is it that God is saying to us as a church, as a people today? What is it that God is speaking to your soul today? It's not a matter of listening to what people are, are saying or what people are doing, but what is it God is saying to you? Noah was so convinced about what God was doing and what God was saying that Noah didn't focus on what was going on around him. He focused on that which God was leading him into. As we, we, we spoke about this um, uncharted territory, and, um, on Sunday, the message I was preaching, is, is, it talks about the fact that um, there was a transition that was taking place between um, Moses and Joshua, and Moses had taken the children out of out of Egypt and children of Israel out of Egypt and brought them uh, through the, re the, the, the Red Sea and he had brought them now um, on the plain of Moab and they were heading towards Sinai but all of a sudden Moses' time had expired and it says that there was a transition that was taking place and I can only imagine what was going on that people were, 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 they may have been grumbling or some people they may have been attached to Moses some were attached to Joshua but regardless there was a transition that was taking place but at the end of the day there's no there was there wasn't any any there isn't any written evidence where they were complaining saying that God this is what we've always been doing Yes, they, they, don't get me wrong. They were complaining at one point that so they wished they were back in Egypt. But here it is that as a transition was taking place, Moses was listening to God and Joshua was listening to God and Joshua was surrendering to God. And they were pushing forward knowing that regardless of what took place in Egypt, regardless of the, the unbelief that took place before we crossed the Red Sea, we're pushing, we're moving forward because God is speaking and whatever God is doing, we're going to be obedient to what God is saying and what he's doing. We're going to move forward. Here it is that Noah found himself in a position that he didn't bother to cry about what should have been or what could have been, but he decided to just build. He decided to push forward because if God said it, then who am I to neglect and to go in a different direction? I want to encourage this church, uh, children of God, I want to encourage you that though we are saved by the grace of God and we're walking in the grace of God, it is my hope that you're walking in the grace of God, having understood that we have all fallen short and it's because of the grace of God where we have all been saved, right? That it doesn't exclude you from the noise and the confusion that is in the world that we live in. But one, listen to the voice of God. Go where he's leading. 
Not only that, do not become distracted by the fact that you have never been in this position before. You have never seen this before. Noah has never seen this before. But no one knew that if God is speaking, I need to listen to what God is saying. Noah recognized that my obedience to God is going to be the, 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 the reason for my salvation. My obedience to God will determine my salvation. Let's, let, let, let's, let's move forward. Noah responded to God, and I'm going to jump a bit fur, much further than in chapter 6 of Genesis. But Noah, the Bible talks about the fact that the flood, the flood went on for 40 days, and Noah was secure in the ark. And Noah was resting in the, the shalom of God, the peace of God, the wholeness, the fullness of God's grace. Noah could cry out to God and say, you know, Jehovah Jireh, you have provided for me and my family. Not only that, he is Jehovah Shalom because there's peace in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the flood, there is still peace. But after 40 days... The flood, actually the rain, ceased. The Bible says that, and I'm going to cut a bit of, I'm going to move a bit, I'm going to fast forward just to get to the, the, the end of this. The Bible says that Noah had a very interesting response. It says that when Moses got out of the ark, it says that what Moses did, he built an altar unto God. So, if we go back to the scripture, we go back to the outline of what is taking place. There's God's grief, then there's God's grace. So, in chapter 6, verse 1 through 7, we're talking about God's grief. But then we're seeing God's grace, where Noah, because of his righteous living, he finds favor in the eyes of God. Then there's God's guidance that is taking place. So if you look at chapter 6, verse 11 through maybe 20 or 22, it talks about the fact that this is what God will do. There will be destruction, but God was going to sustain life. God was going to sustain Noah's life and was going to sustain life of, uh, the life of the, the livestock. Then there was the issue of a construction that was taking place. Noah had to construct something. I'm sorry, I'm going back to get back to my, I'm going back from where I should have started to get to my point. Um, so all of this is taking place. There's protection in the midst of the storm in chapter 7. Everyone that is inside the ark is being taken care of. God's providence is there. God's sovereignty is taking care of them. God's provision is keeping them. Then, as, as the flood ceased, a sacrifice is now being made. Noah's response in, in chapter 8 is that, if God has brought me through this, my response to God is to make an altar to God. And I wish we would, we would, we would take a, a, a page out of the lives of the patriarchs of the Old Testament and also in the New Testament, each time God did something significant for them, they made a sacrifice unto God. It, if we go to the life of Abraham, when God provided a ram in the in the in the in the ticket in the in the bushes for for Abraham's um, commitment to give up his son, Abraham made an altar. Every time there was something significant, there was an altar that was being built. Noah didn't do anything different but say, God, you have brought us through all of this. And I want to give a sacrifice of praise to you. A few months ago, before, when, when, we, when we got this, this new building, one of the things that our pastor kept on saying is that, never forget to give God thanks. All that we have been through and know that we're here, Regardless of the excitement and the celebration, 
never forget to give God thanks for what God has done, what God will be doing in your life. And as I said, we're going through uncharted ter- territories. And, and even so, as, as Noah had to deal with the struggle of seeing the destruction of humanity, but at the same time being able to construct a vessel that would protect himself and his family, God sustained them for 40 days, 40 nights. And Noah decided that my response to God is that I'm going to, not only, I have always, I've been trusting him, but now I'm going to be, I'm going to let it be known to him, and I'm going to make a sacrifice unto him for his grace and his mercy. Noah built an altar. And I want to prepare us, and I want to encourage us that as we're going through all of this, start preparing your mind, your heart, your soul, everything that is within you to give a sacrifice of praise unto God. Not just a sacrifice of praise, but to, to be fully surrendered to God because the altar, the, uh, uh, an altar normally signif- um, signifies a, 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 a submission and surrender. Something has got to die on the altar. There's a substitution that takes place. And, and Moses, and, and this is interesting because here it is that Moses, uh, Noah had to take a certain number of animals with him. But somewhere in the midst of this, because if, if Noah was thinking like me, I'm thinking, okay, well, if I have two lions and two, two, two giraffes and two elephants and all of this, two doves, two pigeons, where do I have time to make a sacrifice? Because if I, if I make a sacrifice, how are they going to reproduce? But somehow in the midst of all of this, Noah's question wasn't, how am I going to make a sacrifice? But it was, God has been so good, I can't afford not to make a sacrifice. God has been so good, I can't afford to make an altar for him. And I I, I know for some of us, we may be saying, well, I don't have the time, I don't have the resource. But you can't afford not to make the sacrifice. You can't afford not to make the time to make an altar before God. Knowing that we have been through so much, we're going through so much, there's so many things that we would have been through. Um, There's been a lot of emotional issues and financial issues and economical. There's been a lot of stuff that we've been through over the past six weeks, not to mention um, the last few years of our lives. But just the last six weeks, there's been so many things that have taken place. But those who are called to be servants of God, to be Children of the Most High God, like Noah, God has done too much for us not to make a sacrifice to God. What is your response to God in this time? Noah didn't wait for the grass to start um, growing again. He didn't wait for the, the livestock to start reproducing. He didn't wait for things to be perfect. Noah took the time out as soon as he got out of his situation, as soon as he got out of the heart. Noah decided that my response to God is to make a sacrifice unto him. And you may be asking, what sacrifice am I talking about? In all of this, have you surrendered your time to God? Have you surrendered to God your entire being? The altar is, it's symbolic of going to God with devotion and sincerity, knowing that God, this is what I'm bringing to you. As a symbol, as a as an indication of my love for you, knowing that in spite of the fact that we're living in chaos, in spite of the fact that we're living in uncertainty, in spite of the fact that your judgment is sure, your mercy is also sure. God, in spite of all that we have been through, your grace has kept us. Paul says, well, in fact, this is in, in Corinthians, not just Paul is saying. It says, 
This is Paul is struggling, and Paul has experienced the grace of God, but Paul is struggling. And in 2 Corinthians verse chapter 12, verse 9, it says, after Paul cried out to God, he said, the response was that my grace is sufficient for you. He says, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. And Paul turned around and he says, he says, therefore I will boast even, he says, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. Here it is that Paul is saying, Paul is complaining about the issue that he's going through, even though he has accepted the grace of God, because there's no one has written more about the grace of God than Paul. But Paul says that I'm still struggling with this one thing. But God responded to him and says that, Paul, you don't need to complain because my grace is sufficient to keep you. And Paul then responded and he says that, hmm, God, if your grace is so wonderful and so potent, so beautiful and so reckless to take care of me, says that, I'm going to make an altar, and I'm going to put my, 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 my desires to the side. I'm going to put my, my frustration to the side, and I'm going to trust you, knowing that even in my weakness, God, your grace is there to sustain me. Your grace is there to keep me. Noah must have been tired to be building such a massive structure. He must have been tired. But, he, you know, we're complaining about the fact that, well, I can't say we. I know that for me, I'm saying, well, I'm bored. I'm just like, I'm tired of being inside a house. I want to go outside. I want to do something. I want to just go in the store and just go, go window shopping. And I want to walk around. And I want to, I want to enjoy all that's going on around me. And, and I'm like, I'm tired of being in the house. I want to, I want to go back to normal. But here it is that, Noah didn't complain about the fact that he's been trapped in the ark for 40 days. <laughs> for some strange reason, as I was reading through this today, I was thinking about, it must have smelled really bad in there. And I'm thinking about all of this, and I'm like, in spite of all of that, Noah decided that my grace may be, the grace of God is upon me, and the grace of God has sustained me. But I'm going to yet trust him, and I'm going to honor him by making an altar to him. I want to encourage us today to make an altar to God. Make an altar to God, surrendering our frustrations to him. Make an altar to God, giving, giving thanks for the, the fact that in the midst of a storm, he is taking, he's taking care of us. In the midst of a, a, a pandemic where people are dying, people are getting sick, people are losing their jobs. A lot of us, we still have our jobs. A lot of us, we're still being taken care of. Yes, I know that there are folks who are still struggling, but regardless, let us be thankful for what God has done for us and let us make an altar of thanksgiving. Let us surrender to God our desires, our passions, our, 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 our ambitions, let us put it in the hands of God. Let us lay it at His feet knowing that, God, You have kept us. You have kept me, God. And for that very reason, God, I'm going to give You thanks. I'm going to honor You. I'm going to praise You, God. Because one of the things that we can learn from Noah is that when God is speaking and you listen to God, you can rest assured that all things work together for good. You need God's direction before you can prosper in anything you do. However, you still have to submit your will to God, that He'll give you the direction, He'll give you the instruction to do what is necessary, what is needed. It takes a lot to accomplish a lot in God. And I'm saying that not to scare you or to, or, to, or to make it seem as though, oh, it's so hard to serve God. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that there are times when you're going to have to make decisions not knowing what the results are going to be, but you have to trust God. Think about just, just for the next few minutes that we're here, or you're listening to me, Put yourself in Noah's position. 
you are being asked to build a massive ship to keep people around you safe, your family safe, the animals around you safe, because there's going to be a flood. You've never seen a flood to begin with. You probably have never really seen a thunderstorm to begin with. You've never seen a massive structure being built. But God is saying, I'm going to do this, and I need you to do this because of what I'm expecting on the other side. What is it that God is saying to you today that eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard? You can't understand how you're going to make it through, but God is saying, we're going to do it. Think, let, let, let's step a bit, let's, let, let's step out of biblical times and look at the, 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 scenario which, the scenarios in which we're living in today. If you're living in the United States of America, can you imagine or could you have imagined a time when the entire country would be on lockdown? where flights, the, the, the hairline industry, wow. let, me, let me try to paint a picture. You go to the airport, there's no lines. Can, can you imagine that? You go to this, you, 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 there's so many things that are taking place around us. Like we, could, we could have never really, well, I couldn't imagine it before. But here it is that it's taking place. And God is saying, in the midst of all of this, I want you to trust me. Because something good is going to come out of this. So if you just trust me, and I want to encourage you to know the voice of God, that God is speaking to you. Because the, the, the success of Noah was the fact that he understood that it was God that was talking to him. Let me, just, let me just step a bit further. When you think about someone like Abraham, Abraham's success was because he understood and he knew that it was God that was talking to him. When you look at someone like Joseph, Joseph was only successful because he knew that it was the voice of God that was speaking to him. When you think about someone like the prophet Samuel, he was only successful because he knew that it was God that was talking to him. When you think about, so, so think about, let me pause just for a bit and look at the life of Samuel. Samuel was a boy and Samuel had to understood and be reassured that what he was hearing was God for him to speak to his is, is, is mentor, his father, his priest about what God was saying. The success of these people in the Bible is based on their, 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 their awareness of God's voice. Because as we, as we transition from the wilderness to the promised land, we're going to need to ensure that we're listening to the voice of God. As we transition from Moses to Joshua, we got to ensure that we're listening to the voice of God. As we transition from, from, from a place of judgment, Noah had to be, be sure that this was the voice of God. Because if it wasn't for the voice of God, or if it wasn't for his awareness that it was the voice of God, then Noah may have missed the mark. Don't miss the mark today. Do not miss the mark. Listen to the voice of God. Listen to what God is saying in his word. Noah, was, well, Noah rest ashore in his journey knowing that God was speaking to him. It's uncharted, but if you listen to the voice of God, your next step will not be in vain. Your next step will not be misguided. But only if you're fully aware that this is what God is saying, this is what God is doing. And once you make the step, you'll be able to make the sacrifice, make an altar, knowing that because, of tr because I trusted God, because I listened to his voice, I have peace in my decision. Oftentimes for me, I'll tell people, I don't hear the baritone, Rob, this is a time for you to move forward. But I trust 
the voice of God during my time in prayer and consecration with God. And God gives me peace to move forward. And you may be looking for God to speak to you in a certain voice, but maybe God isn't speaking to you in this voice, so you're looking for God to speak to you. I feel like I'm digressing, but I want to close with this thought, that the voice of God is so important that in the midst of confusion, in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of frustration, God can speak peace to your situation. When the disciples were on the boat, they were crossing over. Jesus spoke, and they heard Jesus' voice. The wind ceased. They rest ashore, knowing that Because Jesus spoke, then it is well. Listen to the voice of God. Close by saying, yes, you have the grace of God like Noah had found favor in the eyes of God. Yes, the grace of God is on your life. But even though the grace of God is on your life, you're not excluded from trials and tribulation. But God's grace is sufficient to sustain you and to keep you, to give you direction. Be reminded that His grace will keep you in perfect peace. And if you listen to His voice, all things will work together for good because you trust Him. And as you make the transition, as you make a step of faith, never forget to stop for a moment and make an altar before God, to be fully submitted to God, to be thankful, to surrender to Him, reflecting and reminding yourself that if it wasn't for the grace of God, I wouldn't have been where I am today. And if it wasn't for the grace and the mercies of God, then my life, the life that I'm living, the journey I'm on is in vain. But God is here with us today, church. And I'm going to close there because I feel like, based on my notes, I feel like I'm going to go on and on and on. I I, I realize that time is far spent. But continue to trust God. Continue to obey the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing but by the Word of God. Put your trust in God's Word and know His voice. Let us pray. Our Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for revealing yourself in scriptures, God. We thank you for the character Noah, Lord God, where God, he found favor in your sight, Lord God. And even though he found favor in your sight, God, he still had to work, oh Lord God. Depending on your voice and depending on your grace and your mercies, Lord God, you kept him. And when you, when you brought him through the flood, God, he stopped for a moment and he made an altar to you, God. And you found honor and glory in his sacrifice, God. In fact, God, you made a covenant with Noah, God, because of the sacrifice that he gave unto you, Lord Jesus. And here we are today, God. God, we're listening to you, God, and for some of us, we may not understand what it means to listen to your voice, God, but we're trusting, God, that you'll teach us, oh God, to hear and understand your voice, understand your will, God, your divine will, Lord God, and as you lead us, Lord God, and direct us, Lord Jesus, that we will rest assured that you are in this with us, God, and we'll stop for a moment and we'll, 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 we'll honor you, Lord God. Knowing that, yes, there, there may have been confusion, there may have been chaos, but God, you have sustained us, and we're going to trust you, and God, we're going to believe in you. God, I thank you, God, for those who are on the front line, those were moments, Lord, who are working, God, in the hot zones, Lord, God, of this pandemic, God, in the health sector, and in the essential services, God. I pray that you'll sustain them, you'll keep them, God. God, abide with us, O Lord God, as a country, God. In the midst of this chaos, God, I pray for peace in the United States of America, God. Peace, O oh Lord God, on this, on this, in this hurt and, and hurt, Lord God. Wherever your people reside, God, I pray, Lord Jesus, for your peace. I pray, God, for your healing. Thank you, O oh Lord God, for loving us. Thank you, God, for abiding with us, Lord God. In your name I pray, amen. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, uh, it was a pleasure talking.
to you. And uh, we look forward to seeing you online on Sunday as we, we take some time just to give a praise unto God. Invite someone, like us on Facebook, share the, the, the studies, share the videos that are on Facebook or on YouTube, wherever you're watching. And um, once more, thank you. Have a good night and be blessed. God bless. Thank you.